Good evening, everyone. Welcome to our class. And let's see here. Let's start with a word of prayer and we'll get right into our study. Let us pray. Father, thank you as always for this opportunity to assemble together so that we can know you more through your word. We know how vital this is as believers in Christ. This is the way that we renovate our mind. This is how we are transformed through the empowering ministry of God, the Holy Spirit. And with regards to God, the Holy Spirit, we'll just take a moment of silence and exercise 1 John 1, 9, which says that if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. So let's exercise the uh, rebound technique, and then I'll open in prayer. Let us pray. <clears throat> Thank you, Heavenly Father, for this opportunity to, again, assemble together with the believers in Christ and help us now through the agency of God, the Holy Spirit, to illuminate the truth so that we can understand it and make application in our lives so that in the end, you would receive the glory and the honor that rightfully belongs to you and you alone. We ask and pray these things in Christ's matchless name. Amen. All right, let's look at our verse for tonight. And it is taken from Mark chapter 5. I looked at this on Sunday with the church here in, in Virginia. And so I thought I would use this as a, a text for tonight to observe what's there and to see how many observations we can make. We're not going to go through all the details, but I just want us to look at a passage that we're familiar with, I believe. And if not we'll be able to say that we are familiar with it now. So you have an instance here where a woman was um, troubled with blood for 12 years. And so we're going to see what Mark has to say about this and how Jesus Christ intervenes. And remember, keep in mind that this is part of phase two. So when you hear me talk about phase two salvation, of course, we're usually talking about saved from the power of sin, right? But the context ultimately will determine how the word saved is used. And so when you talk about salvation phase two, it could be, the context could be saved from your enemies, saved from illnesses, saved from penalty of death and so on, or the power of sin, which is commonly what it is referred to. So Winston, I'm going to shut your video off here because it's kind of, oh, there you go. Thank you. Let's see. And so we're looking at Mark chapter 5, 25, and we're going to go actually to 31. So starting off with Mark 5, 25. Now, a certain man had a flow of blood for 12 years. That's a long time. And had suffered many things from many physicians. And so she had spent all that she had and was no better but rather grew worse. So you can see that she had exhausted all that she had. I would take this to mean financially. And she has gone through many of physicians, as you can see in verse 26, and it only got worse. So what we're getting a sense of here with this woman is that she had an issue with blood for 12 years and she had suffered many things from the physicians. So it's not detailed in verse 26 what that looks like, but it's clear that she had suffered many things from many physicians. You see this in verse 26. She had spent all that she had and was no better. So very clear here that she didn't get any better but then she heard, let me just do this really quickly here. That Jesus, she, when she heard about Jesus, she came behind him in the crowd and touched his garment. One second here. Let me see who this video is. And so, so again, let's follow the flow. She had a flow, a blood, a flow of blood for 12 years, 
when you get to 26, you see that she suffered many things from many physicians. She had spent all that she had, I would take that to mean financially, and she was not getting any better, but rather grew worse. So this woman was suffering terribly from blood flow of blood. And then get, when we get to 27, she heard about Jesus. She came behind him in the crowd and noticed, touched his garment. For she said, notice what she said in her mind. This is coming from the author. And the author says that she thought, if only I may touch his clothes, I shall be made well. Not him, but just his garments, just his clothing. So that's, we'll talk about this in just a moment here. I just wanted you to see what she was thinking. She said to herself, if I may touch his clothes, I shall be made well. You get to 29, Mark chapter 5, 29, immediately the fountain of her blood was dried up. And she felt in her body that she was healed of the affliction. Verse 30, and Jesus immediately knowing in himself that power had gone out of him, turned around in the crowd and said, who touched my clothes? But his disciples said to him, you see the multitude thronging you. They're all around you, Lord. And you say, who touched me? Come on now, how, do you, how are we going to figure that out? It's like being in Disneyland or Magic Mountain or any of these amusement parks and it's crowded. And so now you're wondering who touched you. That's going to be a hard one to, de to determine. 32, he looked around to see her who had done this thing. Verse 33, but notice the woman fearing and trembling, knowing what had happened to her, came and fell down before him and told him the whole truth. Verse 34, and he said to her daughter, your faith has made you well. Go in peace and be healed of your affliction. It's a beautiful passage where Jesus actually heals someone. And so this is part of phase two, in my opinion, because she was healed of an illness. So this has nothing to do with justification, salvation. This has nothing to do with being saved or born again, heaven and hell. That's not there. So having read this together, please unmute your mic and see. tell me what you see. What do you see in this passage? We're starting with Mark 5, 25, and we're going all the way. I thought, sorry, 31, 34. Mark 5, 25 to 34. If you have your Bibles, you can certainly look at that. It might be easier to read through the text because I'm not going back and forth on the screen as fast as you can on your Bible. I certainly can if you want me to toggle back and forth. That's not a problem at all. But for now, what are your thoughts? 25 to 34. Does anything pop out to you? Does anything jump out to you, at you? And if so, please tell me what you see. We're not going to necessarily interpret it, but I want you to see what's there so you get accustomed to focusing on the text, focusing on how to look at the text of Scripture so that when you study the Bible for yourselves, you'll be able to get a, a sense of how to go at the text rather than say, oh, well, God loves her, God healed her, God wanted this, and, you know, it, it just... Tell me what you see here, and let's see what we can come up with. Just unmute your mic and tell me what you see. Or if you're the shy type, you can certainly put it in the chat box. That's no problem at all. I'm just seeing if you notice anything here. Again, let me read it and flip through it so it'll be easy. Sometimes the hear, ear gate is easier than the eye gate. So for the sake of the recording and for all of us here, let me read it one last time. Now, a certain woman had a flow of blood for 12 years. So that's the problem right there. And had suffered many things from many doctors, many physicians. She had spent all that she had and was no better, but rather actually grew worse. 27 says, when she heard about Jesus, she came behind him in the crowd and touched his garment. For she said, if only I may touch his clothes, I shall be made well. That's 28. 
When you get to 29, immediately after she touched his clothes, the fountain of blood was dried up. And she felt in her body that she was healed of the affliction. So she had a, a sensation of some sort where it was dried up. Only she understood this because she had this dilemma for 12 years. And so she felt in her body that she was healed of the affliction. So whatever it was, maybe it was kind of a menstrual kind of uh, dilemma. I'm not sure. But she had this blood problem for 12 years. But notice what the text says. Immediately the fountain of her blood. So it must have been something gushing constantly. Gushing, gushing, gushing. The fountain of her blood was dried up. And she felt in her body that she was healed of the affliction. No doctors were there to tell her. She just sensed that something was radically different inside her. And Jesus, immediately knowing in himself that power had gone out of him, turned around in the crowd and said, who touched my clothes? But his disciples said to him, you see the multitude thronging you, and you say, who touched you? Verse 32, and he looked around to see her who had done this thing. But the woman, fearing and trembling, knowing what had happened to her, came and fell down before him and told him the whole truth. And verse 34, he said to her daughter, your faith has made you well. Go in peace, be healed of your affliction. So what do you guys see here? Just unmute your mic and let me know what you think. Anything pop out at you, any of you there? 29 to 34, or 20, sorry, what is it? 25 to 34, Mark 5. Or if you want, you can put it in the chat box. As I said, I know sometimes you'd rather hear the comments, and that's certainly fine. So th this is a very interesting passage. Maybe you've heard about this, maybe not. Maybe this is your first time. This is who's in your car corner. This is who you're serving. This is who you are making the sacrifices for. So the same son of God who we're serving to together collectively through the ongoing classes that we study together on an ongoing time, on an ongoing weekly basis, this is who we're studying about, and it should impact you in a positive way so that you can say, the Son of God is phenomenal. He is sovereign, he is powerful, and he loves me. And so here's a woman who just simply touched his clothes, and two things that pop out at me, for me at least, is power went through him, and secondly, she was healed. There's, there's so much encouragement that, that could be found in just those, just those two things that I'd pointed out. Power went out of him and she was healed. She had this problem for 12 years. Unlike the person who was the man born blind, he couldn't see him and she, he couldn't approach Christ. But this woman only heard that he was here. He, he heard about Jesus when you see in verse, um, where is it? 32, he looked, uh, I'm sorry. Verse 27, she heard about Jesus and she came behind him in the crowd where it was crowded and touched his garment. Why? Because of what she said to herself in verse 28. I mean, talk about faith, right? If only I may touch his clothes, I shall be made well. So this really is an interesting passage here. And she had this utmost confidence in Jesus. We don't know how long she knew about Jesus, but 27 says she heard about him. She just simply heard about Jesus. And that was enough for her to say, you know, he's in town, he's around here. He's got this big crowd, but if I can just get behind him and touch his clothing, that would suffice. That would suffice. I've got this dilemma for 12 years, and I bet you if I just touch his clothing, he doesn't have to make time for me. I don't have to beg, 
or anything. I just have to touch his garments and that would suffice. I bet you that 12 years of my problems that I've had here in my, my body, I bet you in, in, in spite of the physicians trying to help me with my blood flow, I am confident that if I would just touch the garment of Jesus, I can get healed. I mean, when you compare 26 to 28, that's a gap and a half, if you ask me. 26 is she suffered many things from many physicians. She had spent all she had and was no better, but rather grew worse. I mean, isn't that kind of typical for today, right? You, you go to the doctor and sometimes you get worse. And so you got to get a second opinion. You got to get a third opinion. You got to get more meds and it's only getting worse. Well, ladies and gentlemen, it's also in the New Testament. And the New Testament starts off with 25 saying a certain woman had a blood flow for 12 years. That was the problem. She had a physical ailment. And yet she went to the physici physicians, but had suffered many things from the physician. You see that in 26? Suffered many things from the physicians. Not only did she get worse, but she spent all on these physicians and was no better, but rather grew what? Worse. It got worse and worse and worse and worse. How many times have you, this is not a put down or a rip against the doctors or the medical community, but how many times have we've gone to the doctors and we've tried to get things corrected and it's only getting worse? Has that ever happened to you? If not, well, good for you. God has been gracious to you and supplied the appropriate physicians that took care of you. But sometimes, not always, sometimes, we see in our own personal lives, in our own experiences, that that's not always the case. We don't always get better. In fact, it all sometimes gets worse. And God seems to be letting us know in the word of God, since we're students of the word and he's seeing that we're trying to study and get to know him better. You've been with me now for some time. And he's saying, okay, Freddie, I want you to expose them to another passage of scripture so that someone there in the study will know that this is nothing new. This is not new for him, her, or they, or them. It's new for everybody. Yet, even though it might be the first time you've, you've received this kind of care, or you're going through something of some sort, God wants us to know in spite of the shortcomings of the physicians here on 26, the focus here, I think for us, is to see <clears throat> that this woman, when you get to verse 28, well, first 20, verse 27 first, she heard about Jesus. So what happened when she heard about Jesus? She made it a point to go to see him. She came behind him. The proximity here is very close by, so much so that she was able to touch his garments. And that was her goal. Her goal at this juncture was to just touch his garment. Well, what about our goal today? Are we willing to get close to Christ? Are we willing to do make it an effort to put Bible doctrine number one? Are we getting closer and closest to doctrine? That would be equivalent in my thought as getting close to Christ. That's the next best thing because we don't have him here physically, but we certainly have his biblical truth and his doctrines right before us as we study together. So again, th having that in mind, when she heard about Jesus, she knew Jesus was somewhere where he was there. So when we know that Bible doctrine is somewhere being taught, we position ourselves and we go closer to that location so that we can be close to Christ. And here's what happened to this woman who thought like this. In her mind, she, she thought, if only I may touch his clothes. Now, do you think that's an act of faith? I think it is. If I may only touch his clothes, I shall be what? I'll be made well. How in the world can you conclude that when you yourself know that you've experienced this problem for not one year, not two years, not five years, 
but 12 years. That's two years after a decade of problem after problem after problem where you have this internal bleeding of some sort that is described as a uh, fountain of blood, which we'll see in 29 again. A fountain of blood that dried after she touched his clothes. First of all, look at the component of faith as found in 28. If only I may touch his clothes. We can't touch his clothes today, ladies and gentlemen, but we can touch Bible doctrine. We can get into his word. That's the best, next best thing to being next to Jesus because it's his word. It has to be taught properly and it's something that we have to intake. So when you do, notice what she did. If only I may touch his clothes, if only I can get close enough to meet, be next to Jesus, I shall be made well. Verse 29 gives us again the imagery of something that was very problematic for the woman here and maybe for us, for those of you who are women. Immediately the fountain of her blood was dried up and she felt in her body that we, she was healed of the affliction. Can you imagine what she was thinking after being wronged or not being taken care of by the many of physicians who only, she only spent all her money. It says it's, she spent all and she was only getting worse to find out shortly after she touched her clo his clothing that the blood dried up and she felt in her own body. Jesus didn't tell her she was healed. He just wondered who, who touched him. She felt in her body that she was healed of the affliction. Was it the clothing? There was something magical about that? I'm going to open it up for questions again in just a moment. Was that, was that the, the uh, component there that healed her? There was something special about his clothes. And then Jesus, immediately knowing in himself that power had gone out of him, turned around in the crowd and said, who touched my clothes? So first question here. Um, was it her faith? Was it the clothing that healed her? Was it, or was there something else that we're not seeing here? Number two, if Jesus is really omniscient, why is he asking who touched him? Out of all the people around him, and if he's God the Son, second person of the Trinity, where we know these hundred percent God, hundred percent man, well, then why at this point here in verse thirty? Did he, knowing that in, in, in himself that power had gone out of him, turned around in the crowd and said, who touched my clothes? And then the disciples said, you see the multitude thronging you and you say, who touched me? For two things wrong there, in my opinion. One, the disciples should have known, hey, wait a minute, you should know this. I mean, only you can tell, you can read minds, you can feed 5,000, 4,000 at a time. And now you're wondering who touched you? There are a lot of people here I know we couldn't tell. We know that you can. So why in the world are you even asking this? So the disciples were a little fuzzy at this point in 31. So either they weren't 100% sure about Jesus at this point yet, because we know when you study the Gospels, there are moments where the disciples believed after certain things. So their faith was being fortified. They were spiritually growing. They were on the the spiritual ladder growing as Jesus was mentoring them for three and a half years. So it's possible right here in Mark 5 that there, what we're seeing is their faith in Jesus Christ or their ability to discern fully that he was truly the Messiah at this point um, and that in spite of all the miracles that he has done up to this point, they were fully not convinced yet. Kind of like when they went out in the sea and he, he uh, calmed the sea and the winds and the waters. And they said, who is this guy that the winds and the waters obey him? So it's possible that at this point, they're not fully, fully 100% sure yet. And if that's the case, that's okay too. Why? Because isn't it true that all of us are on the spiritual ladder? We're growing at different increments and our spiritual maturity and advance tends to change over time. And so that's perfectly fine. The disciples here maybe didn't know, 
But that's the beauty of having uh, looking closely at specific doctrines in the Bible because it doesn't pull any punches. And so he doesn't let us know that something something's not true when it is true or vice versa. He just wants us to know, look, we're all human. We all fall short, but I'm there by your side. I'm there to let you know I'm going to help you in spite of what circumstances you're going through. You just have to reach out and touch my garment or you have to reach out and touch my doctrine. You have to touch the word of God because that's all that's the only way you're going to be able to know this stuff. Only way. You can't you can't pray this away. You can't the woman didn't pray. The woman didn't say, "Oh, please heal me." She didn't beg him. She just said to herself in spite of the multitude of people there, she didn't bother him and say, look, I'm really sorry to bother you, but man, I'm really bleeding. It's been a t rough 12 years for me. You think you could spend time with me and just kind of lay your hands on me and kind of like what they do on TV, just, you know, touch me and I might fall backwards or something. She didn't say that. She just said, you know, if I can just reach his garments, I'm confident that this person, what she little, what little she knows, what's revealed in scripture is we only know that she had the confidence that touching his garments would suffice. And so what does that say about us? Where do we stand? I mean, how confident are you with God and his word? How confident are you so that when you're going through some kind of dilemma, whatever that dilemma is, that if you would reach out to his word, you would reach out to where Christ is found, that you could have some kind of radical change i'm not going to say you're always going to be healed or you're always going to be this you're always going to be that but i do see that sometimes it does say without faith it is impossible to please god and we connect that to this passage and guess what we see that to be a, re a, a fact in this woman who heard that jesus was there and she that said to herself you know what if i can just touch his garments so I'm wanting you to see what I saw, which is her, her faith in Christ, not his garments necessarily, but the clothes that were connected to him. And so she said, if I can just touch his garments, I'll be fine. I know that for a fact. So what was it that got her to be so convinced that she, all she would have to do is touch his garments? We don't have all the details, but what little we do know is that she was confident of that so that could that could teach and that could teach us so many things and we can go on and on and on just on this chapter alone this passage alone from 25 to 34. so what do you guys think i i've been talking all this time now we haven't even started our study. So let me be fair and open it up to you guys. Just unmute your mic if you have anything to say. And let's see what you got. Anybody have any thoughts about this woman here from 25, 28, 26, 27, 28, 29 to 34? Any thoughts, comments? No? Deep okay. Faith. Uh, hi, Teda. Hi. He, he just know that she, she has the deep faith in him. Yes, that's true. She okay. has deep faith in him. Very good. But... Very, very good. Anything else that you can see here? But that's that's a good observation because, see, this is what it's all about when we talk about getting into his word. Because... We have a tendency, and I've seen this with a lot of Christians, and I, I say this not in a way that's putting down anybody, but they rush through it and they say, oh, yeah, I read that chapter. For God so loved the world, he gave his only begotten son. And then when I ask about specific detail, what does it mean to be born of the water, born of the spirit? Oh, where's that? John chapter three. And so I find that if you we miss the details then we miss a lot of things that could help us in our walk. So this, I think, is very eye-opening because now we're, we've got a lot of questions that we can ask this passage here. Like, what does it mean that she was healed by his clothing, his garments? 
And so that's very good observation data. She has deep faith. And, and how did you see that she had deep faith? What stood out to you, Data? How do you know she had deep faith? What is it that you saw? She, well, she doesn't need, need to talk to him or in face, but just touch part of him, the garment. That's right. She didn't even have to talk to him. Today, if we talk to him from wherever we are, we're praying, right? But talking to him, she didn't talk to him. She only reached out to his garments. Very, very good. That was her faith. That was what was evident from this passage. And usually we see prayer. We see someone, you know, uh, so very good, Theta. Anything else that you saw that uh, connects with that? Oh. Well, she's healed. <laughs> yeah. That is the bottom line, right? That's, I mean, how many of us want to be healed from finances, from health issues, from relationship issues? I mean, that's the whole thing is that now I'm hoping people see that phase two is rich. Phase two is about it's life about and now. It's about after salvation. Now what? What are we going to be saved from? Well, sometimes it, it will... For the most part, it's saved from the power of sin. Romans 8 thunders this loud and clear, as well as the epistles. Walk by means of the spirit and you will not fulfill the lust of the flesh. But context will ultimately determine phase two for the believer's life. Are we going to be saved from power of sin? Are we going to be saved from our enemies? Are we going to be saved from illnesses? And the list goes on. It just depends on where the, where the word saved is found. Or if the word is not being used, it's implied in the context of the passage that we're studying. So in this case here, the woman had a blood flow for 12 years. Was she saved from that? It certainly looks like it, right? All she did was touch his garments. And she knew, verse 28 was, she in her mind, she knew that if she could just touch his clothing, He'll be fine. In fact, Theta, you hit it right on the, the head. She had faith. That's what 28 is all about. When you summarize what 28 is all about, she said, if only I may touch his clothes. I don't know about you. If I had a bleeding for 12 years, I mean, like my aorta was bleeding. And, and if I just said to myself, if I just touch his clothing, I'll, I'll stop bleeding. I don't know if I would have that kind of confidence depends on i mean that that says a lot about the woman i mean she must have been around people who knew doctrine because think about the thief on the on the cross all he said was lord believe me uh, remember me when you enter into your kingdom now he's on the cross about to die for a crime that was committed by him as well as the other thief that they were there for capital punishment they were deserving of death. And he says, remember me when you enter into your kingdom. So that, when I first read that, I said, wait a minute. How many Christians know about the doctrine of the kingdom? The kingdom of God, the kingdom of heaven? What kingdom are we, is he talking about? But he knew more than, when we thought, than what we thought he knew. So never mind the remember me when you enter into your, when you get, go to paradise. He said, remember me when you enter into your kingdom. All he said was remember me. And when you enter into your kingdom. So this thief, before he was nailed on the cross, knew some kernels of truth that he was able to share with Jesus. And Jesus said, today you will be with me in paradise, not heaven, paradise. So the idea there is they were both going to die. They were both going to go in to paradise, Abraham's bosom. And so that speaks of the certainty of their death. But the thief knew something that most overlook as far as commentaries are concerned. And they often say, well, he went to paradise. He went to heaven. That's not true. He went to listen to the words of Jesus. He went to paradise. Paradise is on the other side of hell, the other side of Hades, 
where the Old Testament saints were. And so that's a whole nother study. And we've covered this in the past. But think about that. Just like the thief on the cross who knew kernels of truth, maybe he heard people talking about it after Bible class. And they said, well, did, did you hear what we heard? What, did you hear that? There's a kingdom that's forthcoming and the kingdom could have arrived, but uh, we rejected Jesus. Do you think that's true? And so whatever he heard, he seemed to have believed it. And then when he finally met Christ, unfortunately, it was in those circumstances with their, where they were up on the cross. So they were in excruciating pain, and yet he was confident enough to say, Lord, remember me. I said, yeah, today you'll be with me. We're going to die. You're going to be with me down there. And because I have work to do, I got to take the spirits up um, in heaven. And so that thief on the cross had kernels of truth. Now this woman also had kernels of truth because verse 27 seems to imply that when she heard about Jesus, she came behind him in the crowd, in the crowd and touched his garment. So whatever prompted her to say verse 28, if only I may touch his clothes, she learned enough to think and believe that if she had the faith and the ability to just quickly touch his clothes, she's going to be healed. That's a faith. Um, that's a an expression of faith, if you ask me. She knew that if she would just touch Jesus, his clothes, that would suffice. So anything else? That's very good, Theta. Great observation there. Anybody else have anything to add to this? 25 to 34? <laughs> I was just thinking uh, two words in verse 27, the word heard. Before she heard, she had to give a, lis uh, a listen. You listen. Right. You hear, uh, which parallels us if uh, and um, in giving doctrine, a mm -hmm. hearing, a listening throughout scripture. Um, we read, listen, oh, oh, uh, listen, hear, oh, Israel. We, we listen to those two very important words. Yeah. Okay. Uh, the other thing was, and at first when I read 27, mm -hmm. I was thinking she, uh, the word heard, just the word heard was maybe she had a mustard seed of faith. But mustard then when they look at 28, I see the word touch where she didn't physically have to touch him, hear right. him. She just, she knew that all she had to do was touch his garment. So her faith has already grown. Right. In there. The other thing I, I, I noticed is that um, when he said, who touched me and the uh, Disciples are probably thinking, why didn't he know this? Well, he knew. He knew who touched him. He knew. Okay. But it takes me back to the cross where mm -hmm. there was a crowd. It takes me back to Lazarus where there was a crowd. It takes me back to the woman, to the bleeding woman where there was a crowd. And all three put together demonstrates that he truly is the Messiah. Wow. Also, Very good. Also with Lazarus, there was a delay. Mm -hmm. With the women, there was a 12-year delay. Again, <laughs> That's right. Uh, it shows uh, what the women, uh, it shows he's the great physician. With right. the cross, it shows he's the Messiah. At Lazarus, it shows he's the Messiah. That's what I got out of the three. So Very, um, very good. Great observation, Gladys. Great observation. Anything else? Those are so... Those are powerful. That will just, next time I go through any hardship, I can reflect on what you guys have shared thus far because then it really kind of pulls all of this together. It really does when you think about Lazarus, when you think about Israel, when you think about what we just read here and how she just had to touch his garments and she's going to be healed. I mean, there's so much there. There's almost, there's one more thing that I caught in this passage here. I don't know if anybody saw it. That kind of speaks about the kind of relationship between Jesus and the woman. Because um, we know that she has faith. And uh, I, I think there's something in here that kind of speaks to the kind of relationship that they have as far as uh, creator God and creation. But... Before we look at that, unless you see it, anybody else have any thoughts or comments here from 25 to 34? Because this is really rich. 
And even if we don't get to go through portions of the book, I'm pretty content with just examining the living word of God because this is where it's at anyways. So, but we will get to the book. I just want to, uh, I wanted to spend a little time here because this is a very persuasive book or chapter that speaks of the importance of faith. And we're told in scripture that without faith, it's impossible to please God. It's impossible to please him. And here this woman pleased God. We can tell because of her faith. This is whether it's mustard seed faith or mountain type faith. She had faith because the fact that she touched his clothes and she was perfectly fine with that without having to ask for some prayer time, some one-on-one -on -one time. She could have said, Lord, you know what? These physicians, they didn't help me out. And would you please consider my situation? She didn't beg him. She didn't take any time away from him or anybody else. We don't know exactly what he was doing right here. Maybe if we study the context and zoom out, we might be able to get it. But right here, she was very courteous. She just heard about Jesus and came behind him and Touch his, touch his clothes. She didn't say, pray for me, lay your hands on me. She just said, just touch his clothes. That was enough for her. That's yeah. faith in action right there. Confident in Christ right there in verse 28. So anybody else have any thoughts or comments here? This is Karen. Hi, um, Karen. Hi. So as I was reading this and thinking about this, um, what occur what occurred to me is that her health was getting worse. Right. We really don't know how difficult it was, but she's got, we know she's got a flow of blood. Right. It can't be easy to get out. And she's in a throng trying to get to um, Jesus. And a lot of times when there's blood bleeding issues, there can be fatigue. So right. it just made me wonder how difficult was it for her to actually go physically pushing, you know, either working around or pushing through the people um, in order to get to the point where she could actually touch his garment. Right. That's very good observation too. And I, I like that because that's true. That added detail there, it really makes it kind of brightens up the uh, imagery better so that we can try to visualize what she actually was trying to do in this situation here. But we know in her mind, in her thinking as well, it becomes very focused when we look at verse 28. So I don't know if this was before she was trying to push through all everyone or just to herself. She said, if only I can touch his clothes. We don't know where this verse was at when she was trying to get to through to him, when she finally got to him. But we do know that in her mind, she was per perfectly content with just reaching for his clothing. And that's what really impresses me, that her faith was so pronounced that I just need to touch his clothes and I'll be fine. So even if he doesn't look at me as I touch his clothes, I'm going to be okay. Because I've gone to the doctors over and over and over, and I'm not getting any better. But I have a feeling who's standing in front of me is the great physician as per the old testament so again we don't know that for what the text says i'm i'm inserting that now that's my thoughts and that's not what's in the text but we do know that she says to herself if i can only touch his clothing but with all the people around the difficulty of trying to get to him oh yeah that really paints this this image here that just makes it even more exciting to see that if we would get, just get close to Christ, there would be something there that can happen for all of us. I mean, that's why I try to encourage all of you to get into the word, because as my teacher once said, my professor said, if you want to hear Jesus speak, open your Bible, read your Bible out loud. So he says he doesn't speak to us audibly anymore, but if you have your Bible, and you open your Bible and you read it out loud, now you hear God. And so I said, hey, that's a good one. But of course, what he meant was the next best thing to hearing the word of God audibly is to read the, the Bible out loud. So true, because his word 
comes from him. So that is a very good observation there, Karen, as well. I like that because now it's making me visualize even more, especially when we get to this verse here in verse uh, 31. So uh, you see the multitude thronging you and you say, who touched me? And he looked around to see who had done this. So yeah, that just kind of adds some color to what we read in verse 28. So she's having difficulty. She has this ailment physically that troubled her for 12 years. Not, tw not two weeks, not a month, not tonight, not yesterday, 12 full years. And so she was really discouraged, probably desperate too, because of the pain that probably accompanies the bleeding like that, I'm sure. And so she was probably depressed, discouraged. Again, it's not there. So I'm just, you know, saying that if that were me, I could see myself getting discouraged because for 12 years with no, no kind of solution, I wouldn't want to go out and do anything because I have this ailment that's going to be very crippling to me to just, I would have to go to the bathroom. I would, excuse me one second. I have to go um, use the bathroom and have this issue for 12 years. I would be an interruption. I would always be bothering people and I would be embarrassed to be around people because I know I have a problem. So I'd rather just stay home and not inconvenience anybody it would be an inconvenience because you people would have to worry about you and i don't want people to worry about me and you you guys have fun and no we 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 don't want you to be uncomfortable can we give you a pillow can we do this let's put a fan on you let's do the you know i would feel uncomfortable because i would be getting all this attention and i don't need that but sometimes that's what family and friends do they care about you and so on. But this situation here is that there was a fountain of blood that dried up the moment she touched his garments. So he was the great physician, obviously. So it was a, a win for her. All she did was exert faith towards the person of Christ. And that's been our aim, putting doctrine first, putting God's word first, his principles first, so that we can give him the honor and glory that rightfully belongs to him. Why is it rightfully belong to him? Situations like this. So maybe this hasn't happened to you, but is this not grounds for giving him glory and worship because he is rightfully deserves all this? I mean, when you read something like this, how can you not say, praise God? Maybe it has not happened to you, and I'm certainly not having any issue with blood, but, but that certainly moves me in such a way to say, my God is awesome. He is the God man who loves me. He's expressed his love towards, hit, to, towards this woman by the words that he chose to say to her afterwards. I don't know if you caught that. So now let me just go there. If, unless anybody else has any thoughts, I'm going to go no. to Gladys. I do. Okay. <laughs> Good. Verse 34 just caught my attention. Mm -hmm. He calls her daughter. Very good. You got my answer, Gladys. You beat me to it. <laughs> yes. That's exactly what I was going to point out. Notice what he says to her so graciously and kind. He said to her, daughter, your faith has made you well. He's the one who, first of all, he calls her daughter. So there's some kind of connection already. There's an intimacy there that we were not aware of. But the fact that he calls her daughter makes her the relationship between her um, one of relationship, one of intimacy, one of daughtership. And by his choice of words, daughter, your faith has made you well. So he goes and he says, go in peace, be healed of your affliction. Why does he say that? Because of the fear that was coming from her. Look at verse 33. The woman fearing and trembling, knowing what had happened to her. What happened to her? She was healed. Power came out of his body and healed her. So she was fearing and trembling, knowing what had happened, came and fell down and noticed and fell down before him and told him the whole truth. Okay, look, Lord, I was just here. I knew if I would just touch you, I would be healed. 
So she told all that. She probably expounded on 28 and some other things. And then he said, look, daughter, your faith has made you well. Go in peace. Peace why? What do you mean peace? The peace that was that was lacking based on 33. She had fear and trembling. That's the absence of peace. Look, it's okay. It's okay. Go in peace. Be healed of your affliction. It's okay, daughter. Your faith has made you well. So likewise, we can learn from this. Our, I think our deficiencies many times is when it comes to faith. Oh, yeah, you can say, oh, praise the Lord. I believe in God. I believe this. But how about phase two? How active are you? How persistent are you in phase two? Now that's where it starts to pop. Phase one, we know that we don't have to worry about that anymore. But phase two is where we sometimes wrestle. When the big stuff comes, that's where God needs to be number one in your life. That's when the priority of God and his word needs to be there in front of you, like this woman, so that God can step in and do what he so desires. His will be done. So am I saying that he's going to heal everything? You have a backache, you have a back problem, knee ache. Uh, knee surgery that he's going to heal you? No, not at all. I'm just saying that when you look at the examples as set forth in the word of God, the word of God is supposed to elicit a response from those who are believers in Christ. And what's that response? Faith in him. Faith phase one has been taken care of. We don't ever have to worry about that anymore. That's easy. Once you believe in Jesus Christ, you become properly adjusted to Jesus Christ. However, phase two is in this current time and age where we are living day by day, when we will get hit with trials, whether they're self-induced or others induced or satanically induced. The, there's so much stuff going our direction. The devil wants to collapse us. He wants us to lose our faith in him, discourage us. Sometimes the problems we face are self-induced. Sometimes we spend our money the wrong way. We spend it in a way that we shouldn't spend. Sometimes we get involved with things that we shouldn't have gotten involved with. And so now, now we're suffering. We're losing this. We're losing our job. Self-induced. And then sometimes it's others-induced. Sometimes it's just people who are living sinfully. They take a gun. They try to break your house down and they shoot you. And so a bullet hits you. And now you got hit. You survive, but you're still hit. And maybe you're paralyzed. Or on, for some, some don't even live. They get killed. So it, sometimes it's others induced. And so when we collectively see these things, depending on where we are on the map of life, we have to step out in faith in phase two, which is why I've been driving this so hard and saying, look, we're all saved already. We don't have to worry about that. It, the big question for a lot of churches is after salvation, now what? Now what? Now what? And what I've been uh, arguing is we should be now what in phase two meaning we should be living a life of faith. We should be ramping up in those things that relate to spiritual things so that we can experience life and peace, setting our minds on the things of the spirit, setting our minds on Bible doctrine, so that when we get hit with something that's satanic, with something that's self-induced, with something that's others-induced, we have the proper mindset, the proper steps, to make the adjustments when necessary, beginning with the rebound technique, 1 John 1, 9, so that we can make adjustments in, from a position of strength with God, the Holy Spirit, giving us the horsepower needed to make decisions in a way that would line up with God's will and his word and thus bringing him honor and glory by our decisions. Because now our decisions are similar to that of Jesus Christ so that we can say, well, you know what? Here's a problem. But I'm going to do just what Jesus Christ did. I'm going to trust him. I'm going to be like the woman in Mark 5 and say, you know what? I'm going through a health situation. My heart doesn't seem to be as strong as it used to be. I'm going to say, Lord, you know what? My life is in your hands. If I can just touch you, you're not here physically. But in faith, I'm going to mimic what the woman did in verse 28. I'm going to put my faith in you because I believe that you can do all things. I'm not saying that you have to, Lord. I'm not saying you have to heal me. I'm not saying that you have to do this, fix my finances, fix my relationship, fix my heart. I'm not saying that at all, but I'm saying I do believe you can. I believe you can based on the doctrine that I've stored up. And that's far better than having doubt. 
because the scripture is clear, crystal clear. Without faith, it is impossible to please God. So you better be in the, the side of pleasing God rather than making him upset so that you receive the disciplining hand of God. The best way to do that is to live by faith. And how does faith come? Faith by, comes by hearing, hearing the word of God. The more you store up doctrine in your soul as a result of proper exposure to his word, Bible doctrine, on a consistent basis with the use of 1 John 1, 9 on a regular basis so that you stay on the power zone where you get the supreme horsepower that comes not from your superb willpower, but from the su superb God, the Holy Spirit, who transforms your life as you focus in on his word, as you elaborate, as you allow him to enable you to do those things as set forth in his word, and you begin to copy the actions of those as found in scripture, because the word of God is designed to equip us with the fundamentals of truth, biblical truth, so that we can do those things that will ultimately please God. And when we do that, we can expect blessings galore. Not that we're, he's a Santa Claus and if I do this, you'll do this. No, it just shows that when we're properly aligned to him, he treats us as a heavenly father that disperses gift as per his word. If your, heaven, if your earthly father can take care of you, what about your heavenly father? You see all this throughout scripture, specifically in the gospel accounts. And so as you know these truths, then you walk with power and confidence and boldness like never before. And you'll want to live for God. You'll want to live for Christ. And you'll want the filling ministry of God, the Holy Spirit, as you continue to take it in on a regular basis. It'll be almost like an addiction, but in a good way. Because now you feel that you sense that you can do anything. You're impervious to death itself unless until God says so. Until it's time for you to go, you're impervious to death. You don't have to worry about dying death or anything like that because he's put you here for a purpose and your purpose is to live out the Christian life for you on behalf of God. You represent him here on earth so that those who are without Christ, without hope and without salvation can come to faith and be saved as you point them to Jesus Christ. So if there's nobody else that has a, oh, Arlene, do you have any thoughts, comments? I see you there, Arlene. How are you doing? No comments or thoughts? If not, then, Can oh, I Karen? have a question? I'm sorry. Sure. On uh, the verse 34, um, when we were studying James, uh -huh. and um, James was uh, faith without works. He is dead. Jesus, with verse 34, we see her her faith and then her action of touching him. Right. But he said he's specific that it's not the fact that she touched him, it's the her faith. Right. We see in verse 31 that the multitude was touching him. Right. But it wasn't the same because they didn't do it with faith. So that's th right. She she so would that be would that be kind of a an illustration of the concept in James? That would be a type of illustration from a slightly different angle because what James is arguing with faith without works is you have all this doctrine, but you're not using it in life. So here we don't know how much doctrine she has. We know that she has faith. She, her faith was exhibited by her thoughts that she knows if I can, she said that if I can just touch his clothing, I know I will be saved. And so the, the idea here is that her faith saved her from her 12-year ailment. But in James's context, the problem there is that there was a, an assembly of believers who were, who were not applying their faith. In other words, James is saying, you guys have all these notes, you have all these doctrines stored up, but you're not applying it. In fact, if someone comes to you in need of clothing and in need of food, you say, go, uh, go be free, go be merry, and I'll pray for you. And so the example there is that you guys would not even help someone who is in need. So his context is slightly different. We know that the daughter here had faith enough to just, if she would touch him, then he, she would be healed. So slightly different context, slightly different angle. Uh, when teaching the faith without works, but she definitely had a faith 
that was confident in his ability to heal her. So, but that is a type of faith with works, but her faith here or her works here can, resulted in her being healed. So she was saying in her mind, I bet you, I know I would be healed if I can just get to him and touch his clothing. So, but James is um, basically dis reprimanding them because they have all this doctrine, but they're very lax, very lackadaisical in their assembly. And so they, he starts pointing out some examples from the Old Testament and Rahab and others. And so he's really blasting them for being so lackadaisical with the teachings that come forth from his word, which is why the, the beginning says, um, what was it? <clears throat> be doers of the word, not hearers only. Remember that? So they were not doers. They were only hearing. And James is saying, I'm blasting you guys. You need to be doers of the word, not simply hearers. So this woman here was exhibiting her faith. We don't know what she heard. We know she, when she heard he was there, she, in her mind, she said, well, if, if what I heard was true, then I simply just have to touch him and I'll be healed. I'm confident of that. So she didn't have any problem expressing her faith, whereas the, the assembly in James did. They were not doing what the word said. So what she knew was if she can touch him, his clothing, she'll be healed. So context is slightly different here. But yes, I could see what you're saying, that this is an application of um, faith with works. But we have to be careful with that, too, because someone might say, well, faith See, that's an example of why you must do something accompanied with faith, because if not, you're not truly saved. But then um, we can counter that with the word daughter right there in the same verse. But I see what you're saying, uh, Karen, and I would say that would be fair. I would say that's an example of faith with works uh, because she reached out and touched his garments. So that definitely can count for faith with works because she had to uh get through everybody and touch his garment so she made the effort to reach out to him whereas in james from the very get-go don't be hearers only but be doers of the word so but yes very good observation karen that, that difference makes sense thank you yeah that's very good observation and i i like that because yes i can see how she at least applied her faith. She was moving through the people, the crowd, to the point where she can touch his garments because she, if she didn't believe that were so, she wouldn't even make the extra effort in spite of her dilemma. So I think you're right there. Very good. Anybody else? I was thinking that uh, this woman's behavior demonstrated what happens when you give a listen, when you hear. That's what right. happens, what happens, uh, uh, she actually demonstrated uh, by applying her faith, her walk. Right. She heard something, she applied it, and then she stood on what she believed that Jesus could do. Right. So and she, was she standing, applied standing it. In her faith, yeah. Yeah, and, and see this... Uh, Right. Go ahead. <laughs> Sorry. Yeah, and, and this is why we don't know what the end result will be if we would just share to people. In general, if we would just make it a point to share, we don't know how that seed will blossom down the road because they may come to faith, as we saw, as we can see in First Corinthians three. Some would plant, some would water, but it's God who gives the increase. So a seed has to be started. And someone will come alongside and water it. But in the end, God gives the increase anyways. So if we would just get out there and start planting seeds, we don't know what that will result in. And if they come to faith, then that would be excellent. So anybody else have any thoughts, comments? Just unmute your mic. And Rudy, did you have any thoughts? I saw your video there. Uh, um, no, uh, it's very... Uh, uh, the, the thing I see there is the... Uh, the 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 faith that he has is a proper way, right? The faith, and uh, we could always always apply it in our in our life, right? That we have the confidence 
and I see the confidence of the lady, right? That knowing, just believe in in Jesus, yeah, he will be healed. That's right. Yeah. And I I think that's a very good point, Rudy. And sometimes we take that for granted. We we say we believe, and that's why you'll sometimes hear me say we say amen amen on a Sunday, but when it comes midweek or Thursday, are we still saying amen? Are we still giving God all the high fives and yes, amen to you, Lord. But then Wednesday or Thursday comes along when you get hit with that problem. Are you still able to say that? And so it should be there. If you're praising God on Sunday and thanking him for everything under the moon, but then Thursday comes along, Friday comes along, you should still be able to, because that hasn't changed. He hasn't changed. Everything that you heard on Sunday has not changed. Everything we heard tonight in Mark chapter 5 has not changed. Are you going to have challenges? Yes, you are. Does Is that going to change anything? It shouldn't. Why? Because it's faith in him. Our faith in him is what drives the opening of promises that are conditional. Because a lot of promises are conditioned upon our faith. A lot of promises are unconditional, but then a lot of promises are conditional. For example, and we know this like the back of our hand, God causes all things to work together for good to everybody? No, to those who love him. And how do you love him? If you love me, obey me. So that's a conditional promise. God is not obligated to work everything out in your life just because you're his son or daughter. He's not guaranteeing anything at all. He's not even guaranteeing Romans 8.28 to you. He's not going to cause all things to work together for good, nilly-willy. He says the condition is, I will work all things out together for good in your life if you love me. Check it out, Romans 8.28. He causes all things to work together for good in you to those who love him, Romans 8.28. And how do you love him? John 14.15. So when you put these together, they interlock and they form a solid foundation for you to stand on so that when you go through your week and you feel weak, you can stand on his promises. The word of God never fades, never changes. And that's why we study doctrine, because that's the essence of the mind of Christ. And the more we know about him, the more that we can call out to him based on his word. Did you not say this? It's kind of like a warranty on your car. Uh, according to this, I can come in here and when I have transmission problems, you'll take care of it because it's under warranty. Likewise, when you go to, before the throne of grace and you say, Lord, did you not say this, that you'll cause all things to work together for good to those who love you? Lord, you know me. I've been loving you, not based on how I feel, not because I'm saying I love you, but because, as I recall, I've been obeying you to the best of my ability. Am I perfect? No. But as you know, you know all things because you're omniscient. You know that I have been serving you. You know that I've been loving you in this capacity, A, B, C, D. And it lines up perfectly with your word. So I'm not just going to Webster's Dictionary and saying, what does it mean to love? Oh, it means you, you write them a letter. You have a feeling. No, no. I know according to your word, not Merriam's Webster's Dictionary, love means it's the agape kind of love where I'm unconditionally loving you. Like when you were asking Peter, you want me to give you an unconditional, uh, a, a non-surrendered love to you, which incorporates obeying you. And Father, I believe I'm doing that. And so if I'm not getting the Romans 8.28 in my life at the moment, it could be just your timing. I'm confident that you are perfect. You cause things to work together for good in your own timing. And so I'm just saying, Lord, you know, I'm going through something right now. And I, I'm a little uncomfortable, really. I'm a little nervous. I'm, I'm a little discouraged. And nobody else knows about this except me and you, you and me. And so I feel like I should be able to go to you tra transparent and just tell you what's going on. As if you didn't know, I know you know it, but you know, I sometimes have to let you know that your son, your daughter is going through this. And it doesn't mean I don't have faith. I do have faith. I am confident in you. 
I do believe I'm just like the lady in Mark 5, but I don't know, Lord, I'm just going through hardship right now, and I just, I need your help. And so I'm also your son. I'm also related to you by faith. You have adopted me into your family. And so thank you for even hearing me out. I know you know this already since the um, prior to eternity, and you knew this before you even made me. So I'm just sharing my heart. So thank you for hearing me, and um, I look forward to your perfect plan and will for my life as I continue to serve you. And so that would be an example of pulling together after you praise him on a Sunday and during the week you get hit with a problem. And see, as we get hit with problems, this is why it is so critical for us as believers living in this dispensation, in this time, the church age dispensation, the church age time, the church age economy of time, that we understand what his word says, because we're living in a day and age where it's never, ever, ever going to be repeated. The next major, major dispensation will be the dispensation of the tribulation. And then there's going to be a seven year period and everything is going to break and get hit hard by the 21 judgments by the hand of God. And we're already gone due to the rapture, but we're going to see seven years. Well, we're going to know about seven years. We're going to be up in heaven already. Seven years of massive destruction like never before. And then we're going to see in the end, the end of the end, a great white throne judgment take place. And Satan is going to be thrown into the lake of fire. And we're going to see a new heaven and a new earth. And we're going to be blessed out of our socks. And we are going to live pain-free, trouble-free, sinless, because now we're going to be face-to-face -face with God in his new Jerusalem, new heavens, new earth. And that's going to be for all of us as believers in Christ. That's the right of yours and mine. Remember, I'd mentioned, I think, earlier this week, uh, John 1.12 says, For as many as received him, to them he gave the right to become children of God to those who believe in his name. So being a Christian or a believer in Christ is a right. It's not a privilege. It's a right to those who believe in him. A privilege is a driver's license. Traveling on the plane, that's a privilege. Um, rights are Second Amendment, First Amendment, the Constitution. Those are rights given to you. Privileges are health care driver's license, um, traveling on the airplane, those kind of things. Once you see the difference between a right and a privilege, then you start to appreciate that it's a it's a, a right to become a child of God at the moment you believe in him. So you have to first believe in him before you can be a child of God, John 1, 12. So once you understand all of the things that are all entailed in God's word, systematically chronologically contextually you start to really appreciate god and his word once you are familiar with bible doctrine it becomes that much more richer and your stress levels drop drastically as you put your focus on his word his promises and you're being taught the word of god in its entirety so that you can appreciate God and what he has done. You can stand on Bible doctrine and say to God be the glory because regardless of what's going on, yes, you're getting hit with hell. You're getting hit with all these things in life, but you're still standing on him as per Matthew 7. You hear the word, but you do the word so that you're like a person whose life is standing on a rock so that when the elements of life hit you, you're still standing. But the person who's standing on sand gets hit and it great was its fall, it says. And so it's amazing when we see what God's word has to say. And because we're out of time and we didn't even touch the book, we will make up for it next week. Um, let's see, it's 1115. So let me just ask one last time. Any thoughts, comments, uh, questions? Um, Anything? And then if not, I'll close in prayer. Sorry, we did not get to go through the book. This is what happens when we look at his living word from time to time. Well, we look at it every time, but tonight 
I don't know. I just wanted to examine this passage because it's not a passage that's often looked at. So it's just I thought it would be a, a source of encouragement here to remind us that if we can just have faith similar to that of the woman, then we can trust that God will do what's best. It seems like when we have a confident faith in him, so much so that if we could just touch his garment, I would be healed. It's an utmost sheer confidence in God himself that if I can just have an opportunity to be with him, listen to him, touch his garments, I know I'm going to be okay. If you have that kind of faith, you're going to be okay. If it's similar to what we're seeing in the word here, then God sees that. And so it's up to him to step in and intervene and make things happen on your behalf as you exhibit and, and execute faith in him. But it starts with his word. You get into his word, you look at it in its entirety, you look at it um, contextually, and then you make application in your personal life if it's similar. So let's close in a word of prayer. Oh, yes? Yeah, uh, I don't know if you sent the book uh... Uh, I haven't looked at it. What book is, are you teaching? Which book? Like, this one? The one that you're supposed to study. The book. Oh, I I didn't send it out to you? Uh, oh, okay. I, maybe, I'll send maybe, it out. Maybe, the, you're talking maybe. about the um, the basic training field manual, this one? Oh, no, no. Uh, which one? Which is the ending that we have? That, the, 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 the Thursday? For Thursday? The, oh, the okay. Wednesday, the I Wednesday? thought maybe yeah, I didn't Thursday. send it. Yeah, the Thursday. I'm sorry. Okay, yeah. for Thursday. I thought you were talking about tonight. No, I have that. <laughs> okay, you. good. I yeah. thought I was losing my mind. I, I yeah. am losing my mind, but uh, I will send that out to you. And I don't think I sent that one out yet. Okay, I've been, um, I had uh, some things happen recently. And I, I guess I'll share it with you. It's not a surprise or anything, but my, well, it is a surprise for me. But um, apparently Emily's here right now tonight. She's She surprised me and she's visiting till Sunday and then she's going to head back um, Sunday morning. So we're, we made some time. She wanted to visit and see her grandparents and see her, sis, her auntie who's going to be yeah. here till Sunday as well. Uh, Corinne's older sister. And so it was a pleasant surprise. She woke me up and she said, Dad. And I said, huh? What are you doing here? She So it was a pleasant surprise. And so we went out to dinner tonight. And here we are. Here we are. They're upstairs. And I'm down here with you all. So it um, shows who I love more, huh? <laughs> so anyways, let's um, close in a word of prayer. And uh, I'll see you tomorrow if you're interested. We have a... We are using the Zoom link for, not this link, I can send you the Zoom link for Wednesday because apparently we tried it last week and we're able to get the audio going. So although the video is still difficult with them, we did have uh, some audio interaction last Wednesday. So if you wanna join Wednesday tomorrow night, I'll send you all the link and we're going through uh, same book um, because I think it's a very good um, doctrinal book and I'm taking them through this. We just started and we are cover, we're on section, I just finished part two of the blood of Christ. We're going to look at the Christian walk. I think it's the Christian walk. I think that's what we're looking at tomorrow night. But if you're interested, I will send the link on Messenger and on our GroupMe uh, church app. So, but for now, let's close in a word of prayer. And thank you, as always, for your commitment to our studies like this. It really makes, makes me happy and proud of you all because, like I said, I get discouraged easily when I see what's going on around the world. And uh, I know that time is close i think the rapture is going to happen fairly soon how many years i don't know how long i don't know nobody knows and so i do see that the things that are happening is positioning positioning positionally i can't even speak positioning the 
events so that when the Antichrist comes in, things are ready to go. So a lot of the digital things that we're seeing are those things that I believe the Antichrist is going to use. So it's happening at a rapid rate. Technology is going through the roof. This AI technology, I keep seeing all these um, ads for AI and what it can do, what it can't do, and how it can mirror you. It could take your image and make a duplicate image and make a new you, I, I think, and just make you an avatar. And you could be the avatar talking. And if it, it could mimic your voice and copy your voice so much so that the person listening to you will think it's you. And that's scary because how many of you have gotten emails saying, you know what, Arlene, I'm stuck here in the Bahamas and I need uh, $200 and it's me, Freddie. And when in fact it isn't. And so the, the, all these things, these steps are going to be uh, much more high tech. It's going to be harder to crack down on these things. So, you know, we, we have to be at our best as far as believers in Christ. We need to start advancing the cause of Christ and start really witnessing hard for Christ because the world doesn't have any other option they're either going to fall sway to the devil which they already are but we still have the opportunity to win them over for, for christ which is why i tirelessly go through and make these teachings available sure you could read the book yourself but sometimes some of these uh doctrines need to be elaborated and expanded on because a lot of these things are not easy to comb through unless you've had a a background in the doctrinal type studies. A lot of times you may not. And so I've just had this sense that I want to have these ongoing studies so that those who want to jump on and get grounded in doctrine will have the opportunity to start at a ground floor opportunity and just learn along the way. I think that's the best way to do it. And then we're collectively coming together and interacting like this and taking part in verses in the beginning, like what we're doing now, I think that just makes a win-win situation where you're getting exposed to doctrine, exposed to his word. You're getting the opportunity to interact and learn at a faster pace than if you're going to commit yourself once a week and say, okay, I'm going to read tonight. Then it becomes next week because all of a sudden you got a phone call. All of a sudden you found out you have to do the laundry. You have to do this. You have to do that. You forgot to make an email to someone else. And so all these distractions come in. And sometimes it's just easier when you have a committed group that is willing to do what you're willing to do. It makes it much easier to study together and advance. And then when you have someone who's willing to teach you along the way, who's been there before and has has the experience with the kernels of truth that we're looking at and they can provide some additional input and uh, commentary on the key doctrines that we're studying it makes it that much more fun or an exciting and enriching i guess you can say so that way if you're stuck on something you can throw the question out you can put it in the chat box and interact the way that we've been doing so we have a great opportunity to study like this and i would encourage you to invite your friends and family and send them the link where we, we want to expand as much as possible and leverage the numbers the scripture says there's power in numbers and so as we continue to grow numerically online we can expand and get the word out okay so having said that let's close in a word of prayer and i'll see you tomorrow thursday or sunday Thank you again for your time. Father, thank you as always for giving us the opportunity to examine your word. And Father, truly, it is amazing when we see what it is that's accomplished in Scripture. We see how this one woman who was troubled for 12 years was healed just by simply touching your garments. And so it reminds us of the importance of faith in you, that with faith and, and in our focus on you, we can accomplish anything. But of course, it has to accord with your will, because we know that if it was not your will, then the woman would not have been healed, even if she touched your garment. If you decided that you were not, it was not the time to heal, then regardless of her faith in you, then she would not have been healed. 
we've seen instances like with Lazarus where you decided to delay your visit for two additional days so that he would be dead for four days. So there are times when timing needs to be factored in. And so for, with Lazarus's account, he was not healed to the very end. And so it was for the purpose of fortifying the faith of his disciples and even Martha and Mary. And even those who mocked him and, and questioned him, who said that even he could not, if he could heal the blind man, could he not have healed Lazarus? And so we know, Father, that you could have, and you did, eventually you did, because you just timed it in such a way that it would be climactic, where God the Father would be healed, uh, glorified, and God the Son would be glorified through it. And so we know, Father, it has to accord with your will, uh, ultimately. But the bottom line for us as believers in Christ is to exhibit faith in you. That's really the bottom line and the essence of this entire study that we looked at tonight in Mark 5. So help us to have faith that would ultimately bring you honor and glory where we know it would be um, a way that would bring you honor and impact in, in our own personal lives, not because we're doing anything as far as the healing is concerned or the outcome is concerned, but because our faith is in you and because your word says without faith, it is impossible to please God. So we thank you, Father, for this time. I am grateful for every person on this study that continues to meet with me each and every week. And so I pray that you would just continue to take care of them and give them good health, keep them safe at all times so that they can return once again to study Bible doctrine and your word as we examine it together. We, you alone deserve the glory and honor, and we channel it in your direction because we don't deserve any of it. We only are grateful for the grace that has been extended to us, beginning with your son, Jesus Christ, for which we love you. Thank you, Father, for hearing us. We ask and pray these things in Christ's name. Amen. Thank you, Pastor. Amen. Thank you, everyone. Bye, everyone. Rudy. Good night. Bye, Good night, everyone. Good night, Thank everybody. you, Pastor Freddie. Thank you, Theta. Thank Good you, Theta. Again. Goodbye. Okay. Bye, bye bye. Thank you. Thank you too. Thank you, Pastor Freddie. Good night, everybody. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Thank Karen. You, bye bye.